everybody and welcome to the online Sto Tango Music Festival and this is uh, at online, online stotango.org and uh, we are here um, doing a new talk that we are going to share with my friend and uh, pianist Pablo Estigarribia. Hello Pablo, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm learning. Yeah. So today we have a, a very special program because uh, the person who are, we are going to interview is a dear friend of uh, both of us. And I had the opportunity to work with him for many years. And Pablo is working with him um, for a few years now. And uh, they have the trio Estigarribia, uh, La Ballena Estigarribia Cabarcos. And uh, I have worked with him in Forever Tango. I have worked with him in, uh, in Buenos Aires in different uh, um, orchestras. And uh, we are going to begin very soon. I just want to thank the Argentine Tango Society for making this possible. Thank you, Pablo, for being here. And, My uh, pleasure. And uh, we have uh, quite a few um, things that are going to we are going to show you today and after that we are going to have a um, questions and answer I just want to remind you that right after we finish uh, I think it's uh, 8 p.m. I believe in, in the West Coast <clears throat> so 11 p.m. here um, Alex Royman has his uh, concert and uh, so tune in for that and Alex if you are there you can type your link for later and um, okay I think it's time to begin we are going to uh, show you something that I prepared to introduce our special guest tonight so enjoy it <laughs> Is Victor Lavazen. ¿Quién es? es? No sé, es un personaje como cualquiera. Person like anybody, a normal person. And if you don't know the history of tango, that statement might sound true to you. But for those of us for which tango is our profession and our way of life, this is a huge understatement. He was born in Rosario, Argentina, during the times when jazz and American movies were a big deal. So you must be certain at the rise of the curtain, whether you'll stand in the balcony with your cigarette butts or sit in the orchestra with Dizzy and salt peanuts. This is the reason why trumpet was Victor's first instrument. But it was not long until his uncle Hector Chera, who was a bandoneon player and an orchestra leader, encouraged and helped him with his first steps with the bandoneon. At the age of 14 years old and without much experience in his luggage, Victor moves to Buenos Aires and soon makes his debut at the Piccadilly Theater in the underground of Calle Corrientes. But in less than a week of feeling with sound every single musical rest, he was fired. Despite his feeling of failure and his desire to quit, his teacher, Eladio Blanco, who was a bandoneon player in the orchestra of Juan D'Arienzo, helped him to get back on his feet 
and he was rehired by the orchestra leader, Eduardo Serrano. Well, it did help that there was a great demand and not enough supply of pandoneon players. But from there on, it was always one step and sometimes quite a few steps forward. He admired and dreamed of playing with the best and his dreams came true. Among those dreams was the orchestra of Miguel Caló, with which he spent three years of his career, 10 years with Osvaldo Pugliese, 20 years with Sexteto Tango, many years with Mariano Mores. He was the founder, arranger, and composer for Color Tango, and many more that may come up through our conversation. Today, he's here with us to share his actual and future projects and his vision about tango. Please welcome Maestro Victor Lavallén. And hello, Victor Lavagen. Are you there? Hola. Hola. ¿Qué, How are you? ¿Qué haces, Victor? ¿Estás por ahí? Sí, hola, sí, hola, sí. ¿Cómo? No escucho. So, so um, we are going to um, try our best to work together with Pablo. He will be translating um, for Victor, and I'm going to be asking the questions. So, Victor. Um, sí. So, do you recognize the uh, orchestra and the arrangement that we just, uh, which is played? Dice si reconoces la música que que recién pasado. No, no la escuché. No oh, escuché you, di you didn't hear, but decirle que era Pasamos, la este, Gallo Ciego de la, la versión de Pugliese, esa que grabaste vos. Oh, bueno, sí, bueno, sí. Bueno, ah, la pasión de Pugliese, sí, por supuesto, la conozco. ¿cómo no? Sí, so, hice el arreglo. Eso cuando yo empecé en la orquesta de Pugliese, hice el arreglo ese. He says that it, that was actually his first arrangement for the Valdo Pugliese Orchestra when he was just accepted. So, um, we know that uh, you made it into the orchestra Osvaldo, of Osvaldo Pugliese um, after a few years of uh, experience with other orchestras, but um, we are going to get to that. And uh, I would like to start with the question that will be the most uncomfortable question that I'm going to ask dice, tonight. Dice que te va a ser una de las preguntas más incómodas de la noche ahora. Está bien, estamos de acuerdo, no hay problema. So it's very common to hear that uh, some musicians say that Enzo is not one of their favorite orchestras. But you studied with Eladio Blanco, who was one of the bandoneon players of D'Arienzo. So what did you learn from him? And do you agree with the statement that I mentioned before? Bueno, primero dice que hay muchos músicos de la actualidad que dicen por ahí que D'Arienzo no es de su orquesta favorita. Mm -hmm. eh, pero bueno, vos estudiaste con Eladio Blanco y le gustaría saber qué aprendiste de Eladio Blanco y si compartís la declaración de que D'Arienzo no es una de tus orquestas favoritas, digamos. ¿Una favorita? No, 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 no estoy de acuerdo, no. Yo aprendí mucho con el maestro Eladio Blanco, porque cuando yo vine de Rosario, que había estudiado con mi tío, empecé a estudiar con Eladio Blanco, y bueno, y fue ahí a los, al año y algo, empecé con una orquesta ya profesional. Así que, no, pero con a mí, yo escuchaba, cuando era chico, escuchaba todas las orquestas, y D'Arienzo me gustaba. Aparte de tocar el bandoneón y los bandoneones salían muy bien con D'Arienzo. Había que tocar bien ahí. So, um... He's saying that um, after studying for a year and a half with uh, Eladio Blanco, he actually got a, a professional gig and that he is actually an admirer of, uh, he likes uh, D'Arienzo Orchestra and he's saying that it's, it was very demanding for bandoneons to play there. So, um, now I, I have a question um, because you 
moved to different houses and apartments, but I understand that Villa Urquiza was your neighborhood from an early age and after you moved from Rosario, and you still live there. Why is that? And is there any anything in music that you will compare to always living in the same neighborhood? Dice que desde muy temprana edad y a pesar de que te moviste un poco toda la vida cuando estuviste en Capital y viviste en Villa Orquiza, eh, te pregunta si tiene algo especial este barrio para vos y si ves algún paralelismo con la música de esto. No, no, lo que pasa, bueno, yo viví, primero vivía en Palermo, en un lugar ahí donde estaba Troilo, vivía una cuadra de mi, donde vivía yo. Pero después, bueno, con, tengo buenos recuerdos de Villa Urquiza porque empecé con a pesar profesionalmente a tocar ahí tenía 14 años cuando empecé profesionalmente y bueno entonces tengo un buen recuerdo no mi primer paso como profesional fue cuando vivía en Villurquiza cuando vivo he says that he says that one of uh, his greatest memories of Villurquiza is that his debut at the age of 14 as a professional bandoneonist was in that neighborhood and he carries uh, feelings for that and oh And also he said that his first house was in Palermo and he used to live like very close to Aníbal Troilo's house. Yeah, I um, actually uh, was going to ask you about that. And I know that your mom uh, used to talk to the mother of uh, Pichuco, of Troilo, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you didn't meet him back then. And when did you meet him personally? Dice que sabe que que tu mamá charlaba con la mamá de Troilo cuando vivían ahí cerca, viste que contaste que estabas en Palermo. Sí. Eh, y dice, ¿cuándo, ¿cuándo fue la, la primera vez que oficialmente lo conociste a Troilo? Digamos? Bueno, Aníbal Troilo sabía, yo escuchaba orquesta así, pero yo en esa época, cuando mi mamá conversaba con la mamá de Troilo, escuchaba mucho jazz, entonces había muchas películas, bueno, me gustaba el jazz de, de entrada, ¿no? Y a Pichuco lo conocí cuando, después de muchos años, cuando yo estaba con el Seteto Tango, tuvimos Mar del Plata haciendo una temporada. En verano se acostumbra a hacer acá, se hacía, se hace todavía, ¿no? Temporadas de tres meses, cuatro meses. Y bueno, y Pichuco no trabajó ese año y venía todas las noches a vernos nosotros. Y bueno, ahí destacamos fotos, en fin, ahí lo conocí a Pichuco, un tipo de 10 puntos, ¿no? un gran maestro. Well, he was actually saying that um, he officially uh, met uh, Pichuco uh, later on, not when he was a kid and he was living in Palermo, but when he was already a professional bandoneonist and he was playing with Sexteto Tango. He's saying that he, they met in uh, Mar del Plata, which is a beach city and the coast of Argentina. and. Um, He's saying that actually Pichuco was the one that was coming to one of their concerts with Secteto Tango and uh, saying that he was a great guy and he took pictures with everyone and apparently he liked Secteto Tango. Troilo. So I also heard that Aníbal Troilo asked you to condition his instrument and um, what could you do that he couldn't do with his instrument? And when we are talking about uh, conditioning the instrument, we are talking about, um, we call it ablandarlo. It's like when you have a new engine, you have to run it a little bit before you can go full power with it. Dice que, que una vez dice que, que Troilo te pidió que le ablandaras el bandoneón. Ah, sí, 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 es verdad. Eh, y eso y dice que... Me dice, pibe, sí, porque tenía un bandoneón que recién habían afinado. Entonces, bueno, me dice, pibe, dice, no me lo puede tocar el bandoneón que... Digo, sí, gordo, démelo. Yo decía gordo, viste, todo cariñosamente le decíamos gordo, ¿no? Digo, sí, no hay problema. Bueno, y después le digo, mire, dos do, do días, no puede tocarlo, viste, porque no, no rendía. Era muy duro. Era muy duro. Entonces digo, mire, discúlpeme, gordo, pero no lo puedo. Yo no me doy cuenta, yo no, no te haga problema. Pero igual te agradezco, viste, sí, que, en fin. Pero sí, no se pudo tocar, ¿no? Claro, y eso que ustedes zapaban ahí con el sexteto. Sí, no, por, justamente me lo dio por eso. Como vos, ustedes zapan ahí, viste, que tocan fuerte, que se yo, se lo van a venir bien. Sí, bueno, pero no puedo tocar. Me quedaba, quedaba muerto, viste, cuando terminaba claro. de tocar. Dos días. Bueno, well, saying, he's saying that um, at once Troilo uh, just tuned an instrument de bandoneón and asked Victor to condition to some, like, soften, break, 
you know, soften the instrument a little bit. And uh, because in Secteto Tango, that was the group that we mentioned before that Victor was playing, um, they used to play very strongly, very, very vigorously. And Troilo assumed that this was going to uh, condition the, uh, the instrument. And after two days, Victor said that he gave it back and he said it was too too hard to to play the, the 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 keyboard was too hard to play and he would will end up very tired after playing with that one and uh, Troilo said yeah I know I'm sorry and thank you for trying yeah so we are talking about um, Aníbal Troilo and um, Aníbal. I'm sorry we have some okay so we are talking about Aníbal Troilo uh, he was called Pichuco, and he was uh, one of the greatest bandoneon players and composers. And um, I, I will say that if you can talk about Daniel Troilo and Astor Piazzolla are the two icons of uh, bandoneon. Of course, there are many others, but um, they were at the top. And uh, so Victor met Aníbal Troilo, and um, and he didn't play. He never played with Aníbal Troilo, right? Victor, did Dice, you... nunca, nunca tocaste con Aníbal Troilo, ¿no, Victor? No, no, no tuve suerte, no, no tuve la suerte de estar con Troilo. Me hubiera gustado. Me hubiera yeah, gustado, did, pero no, no. no he pude, did not no, play no with entrar. Aníbal Troilo, but it's one of the orchestras that he will have loved to, to be with as well. But I guess, uh, since he has been with so many orchestras, it's not possible to play with all of them. So, um, we are going to ask you now um, because when you develop your career as a musician there were no schools for no school for bandoneon or tango so neither were there when i learned bandoneon but you learned from your pairs who we could say were all the big boys of tango so what's the difference between learning by sitting and performing next to these guys versus listening to them on a cd what did you learn from them? Dice que cuando vos aprendiste a tocar tango, tanto a arreglar como a tocar el instrumento, a tocar el estilo, eh, no había escuelas y no había maestros, sino que más bien aprendías de los tipos que tenías al lado, de, 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 los, de los que ya sabían, digamos. ¿no? Entonces dice, ¿qué diferencia ves entre aprender así y tener solamente los discos y escuchar los discos? Bueno, claro, es mucho más fácil tocar al lado de los grandes, ¿no? Yo tuve suerte, porque yo estuve al lado de, de grandes bandoneonistas y músicos, ¿no? Que buenos arregladores, que tocaban muy bien. Yo tuve la, tuve la suerte de tocar al lado de Julián Plaza, de Leopoldo Federico, de Julio Ahumada, de Máximo Mori. Y después había otra, una línea ahí, que no diríamos que estaba en segunda línea, sino eran de primera, pero no eran conocidos, pero tocaban muy bien. Yo tuve suerte y toqué con todos ellos, ¿no? Y yo empecé, lo que pasa es que yo escuchaba mucho al principio, entonces cuando escuchaba su orquesta la tenía tan en el oído que yo podía tocar tranquilamente, mirando la música de lo que tocaban, que yo, yo lo podía tocar porque lo tenía todos los arreglos en la cabeza, mía, con Darienzo, Troilo, eh, qué sé yo, Piazzola, Fresedo, el, el Gobi, en fin, toda su orquesta, se, se escuchaba mucho antes la su orquesta, entonces era también ayuda, ¿no? Pero tocando al lado de los grandes mejor, mucho mejor. Así que aprendí mucho ahí, ¿no? He's saying that, uh, of course, uh, there is a big difference between uh, just listening, but uh, listening to the recordings and actually playing. Just aside from from the uh, the great bandoneonists and tango musicians of the era, but he's saying that when he got to that place. He was actually listening to a lot of music, and he knew many of the uh, famous arrangements by heart. So once he once uh, he got with um, he got to play with the uh, Pugliese, he knew the the structure and the style of the orchestra. So he it wasn't so difficult for him to to uh, learn it because he already had this music in his ear, but. Uh, he's saying that he was very lucky and he got to play uh, with the with the greatest bandoneonists of all time, like uh, Julian Plaza, Leopoldo Federico, Maximo Mori, Julio Almada. Well, these are the, the biggest names in, in, in bandoneon, uh, I think. What, what do you think, Hector? I will have to agree. 
um, because, <laughs> yeah, so um, when when I hear Victor Lavagen to play bandone, uh, playing bandoneon, I can recognize his sound immediately. But um, if he had to name maybe two or three of the main influences that he had as a bandoneon player, who would he name? Dice que, Víctor, que cuando vos tocas como que tenés un sonido muy propio, ¿no? Y dice, pero sin, sin duda tuviste influencia de otros bandoneonistas. Si tuvieras que nombrar tres bandoneonistas que te influenciaron en tu manera de tocar, ¿a, a quién nombrarías? Y bueno, sí, yo nombraría a, a, a Massimo Mori, Julián Plaza y Ruggero. Well, there you have it. Maximo Mori, Julian Plaza, and Osvaldo Roger. So I'm uh, typing those names in the in the chat room. So if you want to check them out, um, you can check them out. So so in in terms of arranging, who are his main influences? Ahora te pregunta por, eh, por las influencias que tuviste a, a la hora de arreglar. ¿Quiénes son los arregladores que te influenciaron para, para cómo escribir, digamos? Ah, bueno, bueno, yo tengo... Bueno, Julián Plaza es uno de ellos, ¿no? Emilio Balcarce, en fin, este, Pascual Mamone, en fin, Alfredo Gobi, Pulice, todos eran grandes arregladores. Entonces a mí me, yo, me gustaba mucho todo eso, ¿no? A mí me gustaban en realidad todas las orquestas, ¿no? Porque, por ejemplo... Bandoneonista también, había otro que yo no lo no, nombré, no, pero Eduardo del Piano me gustaba mucho, porque era un tipo muy, muy así, un estilo rullero, era recio, pero con buen sonido, ¿no? Tipo de, de polenta, pero con buen sonido. Y había, y entonces todos esos todos eran buenos arregladores, uno siempre aprende de todo, escuchando, ¿no? Lógico, ¿no? Este, escuchando y tocando, ¿no? He's saying that he learned a lot from listening and playing, and that... Uh... He, he named a few of, of the greatest arrangers that, that he admired, Julian Plaza, Emilio Valcarce, El Cholo Mamone, Pascual Mamone, eh, Alfredo Gobi, Osvaldo Pugliese. And he's saying that at that time, aside of the greatest uh, arrangers that we already know, there were some unknown arrangers that were also good and that he learned from, and he named uh, Eduardo del Piano. So um, here we are um, asking questions and we give limits, uh, limits of three. And now I would like to hear if he had to name three different styles that, that he likes. Which ones will dice, he choose? Dice que nombres tres estilos que te gusten. ¿Cuál, cuál elegirías si tienes que elegir solo tres? Bueno, entonces, bueno, bueno, a mí me gusta mucho, me gustaba mucho Franchini, con los arreglos de Juan José pa y Plaza, ¿no? Que arreglaban los dos. Yo toqué ahí también, ¿no? Pero me gustaba el estilo ese de... de, de primero Franchini Pontier, pero después me gustó mucho más Franchini. Y bueno, después me gustó Alfredo Gobi, me gustó Troilo, me gustaban varios, Pugliese, hay muchos que me gustaban. Hay varios que me gustaban. He's saying that um, maybe it's difficult for him to just name three, but he, he did talk a bit about the orchestra of uh, Enrique Mario Francini, especially when the arrangers were Juan José Paz and uh, Julián Plaza. He actually played in this orchestra. Uh, pero el primer bandoneón era Ahumada, ¿no? De Francini. So the first... He was uh, uh, playing with uh, Juli uh, Julio Mada as a, as a lead bandoneon, and uh, he also named uh, Gobi, Troilo, Pugliese, and Francini Pontier. But he made a special, special mention to this uh, Francini orchestra that I, I heard and I, I definitely recommend checking out. It's amazing. So um, I see that the name Julian Plaza, and always when I talk to Victor, Julian Plaza is a name that comes up all the time. And uh, why is that that Julian Plaza is so um, so close to him? Dice que siempre que hablamos con vos, eh, charlamos mucho de Julian Plaza. 
eh, ¿Era tu amigo? ¿Eran cercanos? ¿Cómo era tu relación con sí, Julián Caló? Sí, no, era mi amigo. Sí, bueno, yo cuando empecé con Miguel Caló, yo empecé con Miguel Caló y él no estaba. Estaba de gira con una orquesta Bianco que estaba por Europa. Pero después, cuando volvió, se sí, incorporó la orquesta de Caló. Y yo tenía 15 años, 16 años cuando empecé con Caló. Y él tendría 20, 22, 23, ¿viste? Entonces... Lo conocimos ahí, somos de, de, lo conozco de esa fecha, ¿viste? Mucho, un montón de años. Después tuvimos muchos lugares juntos, con Estampones, con Pulise, con el Seteto, y con otras orquestas así que no son muy conocidas, pero hemos tocado juntos también. Así que lo conozco de mucho tiempo. So he said that they actually are good friends, were very good friends, and that they met uh, Miguel Caló, que es the one that you mentioned before uh, in the intro, Hector. And he was 15 years old, and Julián Plaza was 22. And since then, they have been playing together in many different ensembles, uh, including Sexteto Tango, Osvaldo Pugliese, and um, Atilio Estampone also. So for people who don't know who Julián Plaza is, um, we can uh, tell you, well, first of all, he played um, piano and he played bandoneon. He played both instruments. And uh, he also composed many well-known pieces. Um, for example, one of them is Payadora. Um, so Pablo, what other pieces would you mention from Julian Plaza that people will know? Well, there's two that are in every uh, improvised repertoire of tango that are Nocturna and Danzarín. That's almost a given. Big But then he, we have Alex he Roman also that has said the two pieces as well. Yeah, th those are the very good, very well-known ones. But then you, he has melancólico, nostálgico, mm -hmm. um, sensiblero, um, I don't know, so many. He was such a great composer. And he was a very prolific composer, so um, many, many great pieces. Um, Estamos recordando las piezas de Julián Plaza y diciendo que era muy prolífico, ¿no? que escribía mucho y de calidad. Well, Danzarin, of course, that's... Uh... Yeah. So, um, what defines a style? Like, what elements would you, would, you, um, would you pick to define a style? Are there any particular elements? Dice, si vos tuvieras que definir un estilo, ¿Cuáles son los parámetros? ¿Cuáles son la, los, los aspectos que definen un estilo? Y bueno, los, 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 eso depende de la personalidad del que escribe, ¿viste? tiene mucho que ver con la personalidad del, del orquestador, ¿no? Después uno escribe, por ejemplo, Plaza escribía para Bobby y parece que fueron los arreglos de Bobby, pero eh, los arreglos eran de Plaza, pero después el, el director los adaptaba, así que eso depende mucho del... Troilo también, Aníbal Troilo. Bueno, Waldo Pulis era orquestador, pero también hacía lo mismo. Bueno, muchos directores de antes, eh, la, la temática la de ellos era esa, ¿viste? Bueno, hacían, buscaban arregladores, pero después tocaban, lo hacían como querían ellos, ¿no? Al estilo de ellos. Y tenía, claro, pero yo, yo... Cada uno tenía una personalidad distinta, ¿no? Pero y digo, cuando... Por los que estaban en la orquesta, ¿no? Cuando vos decís el, el estilo de ellos, decís, por ejemplo, la forma de marcar, la forma de frasear, ¿qué, bueno, qué, qué sería? La forma de, de los marcados, las síncopas que eran distintas a otros, ¿viste? la forma de escribir, ¿viste? sí, cada uno. El, or el orquestador tenía que ser muy muy variado, ¿no? En eso, tenía que escuchar, tenía que saber muy bien para quién escribía. Por ejemplo, yo hice algunos, algún arreglo para, para otras orquestas, para estampones, yo hice algunos arreglos, ¿no? Entonces, pero yo no nada que ver con, con yo no me olvidaba de publicidad de todo, ¿no? Escribía de estilo de, de estampones, lo mismo que hice no se arreglo para Salamanca. También yo no, no pensé, yo escuché y bueno, parece que los, Salamanca hizo los arreglos Salamanca, la orquesta, ¿viste? Bueno, Plaza y Balcarce y los, dos, los tres hicimos para Salamanca arreglos. Pero eso okay. no como Salamanca, porque el director es el que le daba la impronta, ¿no? Esa, ¿no? De, de su estilo. So, yeah, basically what uh, Victor is saying that the, the the leader of, of the group is one that um, that um, will give this style to the orchestra. So whenever the arranger had to write 
they had to adapt to the style of the orchestra. And he was talking about the elements as uh, the syncopas, the marcatos, phrasing. What else did he did he say? I think you pro you covered pretty much everything. He was saying he he did talk a, a bit about especially Plaza and him when they had to write for an orchestra. This was a a skill that was very common in arrangers of that time that. They had to write for Gobi, Troilo, and Pugliese, three very different orchestras, and they will have to adapt to the way of playing of the, of the leader. But he also said that the leader, when he got the arrangement, sometimes he actually uh, finished giving the, uh, giving the finishing touches to, to just blend it in the style. So I, I want to make an interruption here to uh, comment on a um, message that we got on the chat room and uh, it's from Umberto Ridolfi that he says that he wants to say hello hello Umberto nice to to see you here and uh, he wants Hola. to how are you so muy bien, muy bien. why don't you tell them directly what you put in the in the chat room well uh, I would like to thank you to invite me here to chat and uh, it's very true what uh, Victor Lavalle just mentioned about the, the influence of playing with uh, other musicians besides you, no? And um, when I started playing with him at the Forever Tango Orchestra, I have my way of playing very humble and differently, but uh, all of a sudden playing with Victor Lavalle was like a, a huge expansion of different way of uh, playing tango and better sounding and specifically uh, ensemble wise too also doing many dynamics and uh, and colors that i didn't hear before with other uh, musicians or conductors on the bandonian no so thank you to victor and his influence well i want to also tell you that um, this is a um, really I appreciate the comment because Humberto, I know him for many, many years, and he was uh, the son of a great bass player. And um, and I think you've been involved in tango for how many years? All your life, I would say. I would say and, so too, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and then you uh, started to play with Victor in Forever Tango, and that was later in the 96 or something like that? Yes, so, maybe. Exactly. You were so, there in the orchestra also. So we have to agree that um, um, Victor is a it's a huge influence for for all of us, and when we see his style, his style of playing, his style of arranging, uh, arranging, and Pablo can um, testify about arranging because um, basically you learn um, a lot from Victor as an arranger. Yes, I was lucky enough to arrange together with him. Le estoy contando, Victor, que nosotros, yo bueno, yo aprendí mucho de, de vos, ¿no? De cómo arreglar y que hemos hecho arreglos juntos, inclusive. Sí, sí, claro. So, um, yeah, so you arrange for, for the trio and for other things. So one of uh, the important things to mention is also that um, I don't know if this has to do with the way that Victor works, but when uh, you came into the orchestra of Osvaldo Pugliese, one of the uh, uh, requirements was that you will arrange for the orchestra. So I think, I don't know, maybe we can ask Victor if that's uh, why he wants um, young people that come into tango and that, that uh, start playing with him to arrange and he gives the opportunity to people to arrange for his groups as well. Is that because of the way that Pugliese did it and he saw good results out of that? Or why, why is it? Dice que, que bueno, que cuando entraste a la orquesta de Pugliese, dice que, bueno, Pugliese era un tipo que pedía que los músicos sean arregladores también, ¿no? Oh. Eh, y te pregunta eh, acerca de tus proyectos actuales. Dice, vos también sos un director que da espacio a a sus músicos para que arreglen y, y les graban los temas y todo. Entonces, dice, ¿vos sacaste esta conducta de los buenos resultados que tuvo Pugliese o de otro lugar o de tu personalidad? ¿Por dónde viene eso? 
No, no, sin duda que por lo de Pugliese, ¿no? porque Pugliese cuando yo empecé la orquesta, eh, el que entraba a la orquesta tenía que ser arreglado, ¿viste? Entonces, el que entraba era arreglador. Entonces, pues yo, esa es una buena idea para la, para la gente joven, ¿no? Porque mucha gente joven que le gusta escribir y no tiene posibilidad de, de que se escuche lo que hace. Entonces, bueno, la verdad que la situación no, no es como antes ahora, pero... Yo, los que están conmigo, el que arregla, que arregla, ¿viste? Por ejemplo, Brusquini, bueno, Pablo Estigarribia, todo. Este, los lo que están ahí, hay, los que escriben, yo les digo que hagan arreglos. Siempre. Porque claro, además es vos... Para, es bueno para la, para, para la salud de, de la orquesta también, ¿no? Porque claro. la orquesta, si no, tiene un mismo sello siempre. En vez con eso tiene un sello, pero con ideas distintas. Entonces, es, es importante. Es importante para... Para la orquesta, ¿no? But uh, he's he's saying that he actually saw very good results with Pugliese and he took the the same uh, principle, basically because uh, he shares that it's important to give opportunity to young arrangers and composers that maybe if if not for for this chance they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to hear the music they write. And um, he also says that um, this is actually good for, he, and quote, the health of the orchestra, because uh, it, will, it will give variety. I mean, you have a style of the orchestra, and then every arranger or musician brings their own ideas that will uh, mix into that style, and this will bring more variety to the repertoire. So we are going to, to talk a little bit more about the arrangements, but uh, before we do, we are going to, um, I'm going to show you a video. And uh, how many times did Victor Lavagen play in Teatro Colón? Teatro Colón is the uh, most important the theater in uh, Argentina where they will do um, opera, symphonic orchestras, but getting to Teatro Colón was the goal of any tango musician because it was not very common for that. So um, when, for example, the orchestra of Oswaldo Pugliese played a piece and the audience liked it very much, they will scream, al colon, al colon. That was the goal. So how many times have Victor played at Teatro Colón? Dice que, bueno, tocar en el Colón para un músico de, de tango, ¿no? de argentino, es como una manera de, de llegar a algo muy importante. Y dice que vos tocaste varias veces en el Colón. ¿Cuántas veces tocaste en el Colón? Sí, toqué, sí, yo tres, tres, cuatro veces tocamos. Toqué con Pugliese, toqué con Mariano More, y toqué con la orquesta, bueno, con el Seteto Tango también. Y tocamos, con Pulisi también tocamos, cuando hicimos un homenaje, que tocamos la yumba, todos los, los músicos que habíamos estado antes. Y bueno, después toqué con Mariano, ya lo dije, y con bueno, la Boca de Escuela también tocamos en el Colón. Y este año teníamos que tocar también en el Colón, pero se frustró por el asunto del COVID este, ¿viste? Con la pandemia esta no se suspendió, pero te la trabajo claro. con la Boca de Escuela, para el Colón anda bien ahí. So he's saying that he actually played three or four times that he played with Mariano Mores, with Secteto Tango, and with Osvaldo Pugliese when they did the encore with the all-stars um, members of, of, of the Osvaldo Pugliese Orchestra. That was in 83, 85, something like that. And you were there, right? Uh, 19, 1985, yes. Um, and he played in Teatro Colón with Orquesta Escuela as well. And he has, he's actually saying that this year he was supposed to play in Teatro Colón again with La Orquesta Escuela and, well, obviously that's not going to happen because of the pandemic, but, man, this, this guy is still up there, huh? So, um, Victor, when was the year that you played at Teatro Colón with Sexteto Tango? Dice, ¿en qué año tocaste con el Sexteto en, en el Colón, Victor? Ah, uh, 1972. 1972. So uh, there were different um, groups that 
played their different ensembles, uh, Aníbal Troilo, um, um, who else did he say? I, I lost track. Troilo Salgan, Florindo Sassone. Mm -hmm. yes. So, Piazzolla. Ah, so Piazzolla. Ah, Piazzolla. Yes. Yeah, but Piazzolla. Yeah. So um, now this is 1972, and uh, we are going to listen to an arrangement. Who arranged um, El Choclo for Sexteto Tango? El arreglo. El arreglo. El arreglo de Valcarce, ¿no? El Choclo. Sí, el Valcarce, el arreglo, sí. So this is an arrangement by Emilio Valcarce of a very traditional tango that was composed, I believe, in 1903. And uh, it doesn't sound anything like 1903. And this is a Teatro Colón with Sexteto Tango. So this was Sexteto Tango at Teatro Colón in 1972, an arrangement by Emilio Valcarce of El Choclo. 
and um, as you can tell it doesn't sound anything like 1903 um, it's a very um, I will say today will be a very modern arrangement as well and Emilio Valcarce was uh, also recognized for arranging arranging uh, the uh, doing the arrangements of the pieces of Astro Piazzolla for the orchestra of Osvaldo Pugliese among many other things and compositions um, but I want to ask Victor, how do you make an arrangement sound contemporary without losing the essence of the piece? What elements do you consider essential? Dice Hector, Victor, que cuando vos compones, cuando vos arreglas, suena tanguero pero moderno. ¿Cuáles son los elementos? que vos eh, privilegiás para, para no irte del estilo y ese tipo de cosas. ¿Cómo manejás los elementos del arreglo? Bueno, sí, uno piensa, yo lo pienso, no pienso el arreglo como, como es el estilo. Por eso yo digo, viste, los orquestadores antes escribían para distintos estilos y eran, la pegaban justo ahí, viste, claro, uno... Claro, después con las armonías modernas también, claro, se usan otra clase de armonía, ¿no? Pero vos, por ejemplo, escuchás una orquesta del, del 50 y del 60, qué sé yo, y, y está, es actual. Porque son todos, son, eran todos muy buenos arregladores. Pero uno cuando hace un arreglo, yo pienso, bueno, pienso en el estilo, como es en la orquesta, y, y después lo que me sale, ¿no? Lo que yo pienso que me gusta. La forma que lo, que lo escribo es lo que me gusta a mí, ¿no? Lo, bueno, a todos hacemos lo mismo, ¿no? Ponemos las armonías que nos llegan, ¿no? Que sean sensibles también. Claro, pero siempre, eh, como siempre, eh, te manejas adentro del marco de, de que haya una marcación, una cinco, sí, una claro, variación. El, el marcado, el tango, siempre el género, siempre tiene que estar presente el género, ¿no? Porque si no, no, no se sabe qué es lo que estamos tocando, ¿viste? El género tiene que estar siempre, la, el cuatro, la cinco, la melodía, ¿viste? En fin, todo lo, lo, que lleva, lo que lleva el tango, ¿no? Claro. Well, he's saying that uh, he he feels very freely about harmony, that he used very modern harmonies. But he also says that back in the 50s and the 60s, uh, the arrangers were already very modern, that they used this uh, more like altered harmony language. And, well, I guess that's a little bit what happened just now when we heard the Choclo. It sounds very current. It, it sounds like... Uh, like very, like today, no? 